Hello, my name is Lenny Zeltser. I teach malware analysis at SANS Institute, and I wanted to spend a few moments telling you what's new in the malware analysis course at SANS Institute in 2017. This year, the course has undergone major revisions that I'm quite excited about, and I wanted to make sure you knew what you can expect from the course if you're planning to take it now. Let me give you an overview of the changes. And the reason why I think it's a big deal is because this time my co-authors and I have spent more time thinking about the best way to present malware analysis than we've ever done before when revising the course. Now, overall, SANS courses undergo several revisions per year to make sure that we're presenting to you up-to-date relevant content. So why is this recent revision special? Because not only did we make some minor tweaks, retired some old tools, introduced some new ones, but we used this as an opportunity to really rethink about the best way to structure content that's designed to educate security professionals about malware analysis and reverse engineering. And we did this on the basis of teaching versions of this course over many, many years. Because after all, this particular course got started gosh, maybe 15, if not more years ago, as a short evening talk about essential aspects of malware analysis. And then it grew over time. And now, of course, it's a six-day-long course that we present at SANS conferences and online. So here was an opportunity to really rearrange, streamline, clean up our explanation to make sure that it's as clear as possible to individuals that want to learn about malware analysis, but that might be a little bit threatened getting into this topic that seems very technical and sometimes is perceived as being out of reach. We want to make sure that this is within people's reach. And so here are the key changes. Uh, content rearranged to clean up and clarify explanations related to reversing malicious code. Introduced lots of new malware analysis samples that are very representative of the kind of malware that you're likely to be analyzing today. Another big deal moved from a workstation that we use for malware analysis that's based on a 32-bit operating system to a 64-bit virtual machine that's packed with tools that can handle 32-bit and 64-bit malware. Another big change, we moved away from Oli Debug, which has been a trusted, well-regarded debugger for malware analysts, towards X64 Debug for various practical reasons. And also, we are now spending more time on code-level dynamic analysis of malware, because that is something that malware analysts are finding themselves having to do more and more to deal with those situations where their fully automated analysis tools maybe don't show as much detail as is necessary to handle a given incident. So let me show you a few um, screenshots of some of the tools that we have added or revised in this version of the course. Now, I mentioned a shift away from Oli Debug. That was a very difficult, very emotional decision for me because Oli Debug is just so wonderful at dealing with malicious executables. The biggest problem, it cannot handle 64-bit code. And also, this tool hasn't been updated for a while. Fortunately, X64 Debug has gained strong momentum. It's an open source, freely available Windows debugger that is very, very actively being developed and enhanced on, on a daily or weekly basis. It can handle 64-bit and 32-bit code. And if you are somewhat familiar with Oli Debug, or very familiar with Oli Debug, you will probably find yourself quite at home using X64 Debug. That's something that we're now using in the course very, very regularly. Also, we got feedback that students wanted to spend more time better understanding code level analysis, both static analysis that we might perform with a disassembler such as IDA Pro and dynamic analysis that can be facilitated using a debugger such as X64 Debug. So we are now spending a little bit more time taking a close look not only at the 
individual assembly instructions that you need to know, and we're just covering only those instructions that you need to know because we know that assembly can be easily overwhelming. But also, we're spending more time looking at how malware uses suspicious Windows APIs to interact with its environment. There is so much that you can learn about a malicious program, even without looking at the individual assembly instructions by focusing your attention on the API calls, and we're doing a lot more of that in this version of the course. We're spending time looking at malicious JavaScript, and we're now doing that not only in the context of suspicious websites, but also we're looking at some attachments that might arrive in users' inboxes in the form of JavaScript. That JavaScript is obfuscated. We have used for the long time SpiderMonkey as one of the tools in the course for deobfuscating such JavaScript, and we're continuing to use SpiderMonkey. It's quite excellent. And the course now introduces some additional tools and techniques for dealing with this type of threat. Also, given the prevalence of malicious document files that include Microsoft Office macros, we've got some new examples in the course to spend a bit more time looking at this type of threat so that we know how to assess a file that has a macro in it and not only determine that it's malicious uh, or not, but also to understand what threat it poses. So we, we're spending a bit more time even dealing with situations where the Microsoft Office document that contains macros might have been password protected. Also along these lines, we're taking a closer look at RTF documents. Those can also arrive at victims' mailboxes as email attachments. They are used as malicious files, as infection vectors, and analyzing them is a bit different from analyzing other documents that Microsoft Office can handle. So we're now spending a bit more time looking at ways, tools, examples relevant for dealing with malicious RTF files. Also, we're now looking at malware that sometimes people refer to as being fileless. In this context, I am talking about malicious software that does not leave malicious files on the file system. Rather, it might store a lot of its code in obfuscated ways in the registry. And this type of malware might rely heavily on injection, memory injection, to avoid leaving dangerous, risky footprints on the file system. Now, given how often PowerShell is being used as part of attacks nowadays, we're also taking a look at malicious PowerShell scripts and learning how to analyze them, how to even deobfuscate their contents if that is necessary. Given that a lot of malware nowadays tries to maintain stealthiness by using memory injection techniques, we've got more examples in the course for dealing with malware that injects its code into other processes, that exhibits user mode rootkit functionality, and we're looking at that malware from a code level perspective as well as looking at it from a memory forensics perspective. Now, there's a lot of coverage of memory forensics in other sense courses right now. And therefore, we in 610, in this course, are now focusing more on code level analysis of that type of malware, although we still do use some memory forensics techniques where appropriate to better understand how code injection works. Also, we have more examples of evasive malware that's malicious software that is trying to detect whether it is being analyzed. For instance, you might have malicious software that checks for mouse activities, looking whether somebody is clicking on mouse buttons to determine whether the system that it's about to infect looks like a real system or whether it might be a sandbox. We're looking at such samples and learning ways of understanding these capabilities and, of course, getting around them. Now, I mentioned that we're using x64 debug. We're looking more closely at malware that performs code injection into other processes and sometimes into its own process. And we are spending a bit more time on that than we did in the previous version of the course. Tools like x64 debug are quite good at allowing us to find code that might have been created in memory of the malicious process or of a legitimate process. We can find that code, we can extract it in its unpacked form and analyze it further if the need arises. So those are some of the revisions, some of the additions, some of the enhance enhancements that we've added to Forensics 610 this year. 
Overall, the course spends six days at a live event or in an online event. We have six sections where we're looking at various ways of analyzing malware. We start with the fundamentals to make sure that people from all walks of life feel comfortable getting started with the topics of malware analysis. And then gradually we go deeper and deeper into the relevant malware analysis and reversing techniques. At the end of the course, we participate in a capture the flag tournament where students are presented real world malware and are walked through various ways in which they can analyze this malware to not only have a bit of fun, but also to continue learning and building upon the techniques that the rest of the course presents. If this sounds interesting to you, take a look at the course webpage that now has the updated course description and outline. You can find information about this course on the SANS website. I'm Lenny Zeltzer, and I hope to see you at a SANS event in the future or perhaps speak to you online.